VFX compositing is nothing but integrating 3D elements like character, environment or any kind of CG to a shot and image. All those 3D elements are done by both 3D and lighting departments to create passes for the compositor to create a seamless shot. I had an opportunity to have Bala in my meetup session. We've been in the industry for more than 8 years, worked on numerous TV shows, animation and future films in various companies. Let us learn the art of VFX compositing and this session going to have a lot of information about how to integrate 3D elements to a shot or an image. Let's get started. Hello Bala, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, so today uh, we have a we have Bala Kumaran, uh, who's been working in this industry for more than eight years as a compositing artist. And uh, he worked on uh, numerous TV shows, uh, feature films, and animation in uh, various companies. So uh, currently, he's uh, working as a senior compositing artist in NoVFX Studio, located in Toronto. All right, great. Uh, so, so my name is Bala, as uh, Venki gave an introduction. So I, so I started in my VFX career as a tracking artist. Um, so it's match mode 3D tracking. Uh, that's about a year. I did about a year. And then I moved to stereo compositing. Uh, and after that, then I moved to VFX compositing, in which I'm doing right now. That's my current job. So it's all. So the thing is, like, I have backgrounds from everything from tracking to so stereo comp is more of uh, you're doing all the basics, or roto or paint, and again two D tracking stuff like that. So that gives a really good fundamentals. And then I'm doing VFX comp, more of uh, like CG integration stuff like that, which I'm going to show today. So let's let's start with the class uh, the session. So let me tell you about something about the CG integration. In my opinion, the CG integration, the, the shots which involves la renders from lighting department, if you put it, that's increasing a lot nowadays. The, the even I compared to like three, four years before to now, it's a lot of uh, shots coming from the lighting department. That's because the complexity of the scenes is increasing in the production level. Uh, so you can see all the TV shows are shooting for movie level quality, right? Some are some are very close to movie level quality. So so the demand is like that. So nobody wants a 2D, uh, 2D, uh, like a 2D elements anymore. I mean, we are still using 2D elements and so, but the need for CG integration uh, is a lot more than sometime before. Uh, so this is very important. And so in this session, we will talk more about what is the pipeline uh, involved in a shot like this. So basically what we have is a plate and it's a simple, uh, just one object uh, robot uh, element here. So so let's do it with the pipeline, how it all starts, right? Like, so a studio or, or a freelance work, you get a shot like this. And so when, when they, uh, so when they assign an artist for the modeling, so they do modeling of this robot at the same time on the parallel, they also do uh, layout and tracking for the scene. Mm. So in parallel, this will happen. But the layout artist, what they will do is like, they will go and set up the scene, right? So you need the right scale of where this geo will go in the scene. So they will go set it up. They will have LIDAR data from the, uh, uh, from the production uh, shooting spot. So they will put all those details to rebuild the scene in a proxy level. And uh, this will be passed on to the animation department. In parallel, they will be building this robot, and uh, they will texturing, or maybe not, and they will give it to the animation. Animation doesn't need texturing, so they will bring it in, and they will put the scene together. If there is an animation involved, it will happen. And then it goes to the lighting department. Uh, so they put the shader on, and they set up the light. And then if there is any effects involved, something like elementary particles going around his hands. So I'm just saying as an example, uh, then it goes to the effects as well. Then both the renders comes to you as a compositor. Uh, we are going to work with lighting renders and effects renders. So in this shot, we just have uh, from lighting department. Um, so it's just a lighting render. So 
now you have the scene now you have the plate assigned to you and uh, now you have the cg renders assigned to you now we have this so this is the cg render uh, assigned to you so what do you do as a first step right that's um, as a as a, i believe everybody is uh, a little bit uh, starting in the, the in the industry so so it'll be really overwhelming okay this shard is assigned to me what do i do at first so uh, what my approach how do i do is i go and read the scene or the shot first uh reading the scene in the sense um okay first thing is as a compositor we are just playing with lighting right most of our work is adjusting the lighting when the lighting renders come in it's about 80 percent or sometimes 90 percent or sometimes you're lucky it's 95 percent done uh, you are doing only the remaining 5% to push it as realistic as possible until the client approves or satisfied, right? Uh, so, so we are dealing with mostly the lighting. Uh, so we have to get a grip of what the lighting of this scene is. So what does that mean? So first thing you will go about is, okay, what is the, uh, what are the sources of light in this shot, right? Uh, how intense the light is. Is it uh, how intense the light is? So, and this will give you a little bit idea of intensity, how hot here is the specular highlights. And what is the direction of the light? Very important. And what, uh, so the direction of, direction of the light will also give you an idea about uh, the shadow direction and the softness, shadow quality means softness of the shadow and the color, even it's not neutral black, it, it'll have some color in it. So you gather all this information from the scene. That's like the first step. Uh, because what you're ultimately trying to do is mimic this lighting into your CG render. The CG render might not have all this baked in, so that's what you come, uh, that's what you're gonna do. So in this shot, uh, for example, if we take, it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can all see it's outdoor shot, one light, main uh, key light, sun, and there's a fill light, a sky. So this is pretty straightforward. You can see the direction uh, also here. So this is a straightforward shot. Uh, and, but in a shot like this, sorry for the poor image quality of this is bigger. I just grab whatever I can from Google. Um, so in a shot like this, you can see multiple lights are involved. That's why I was telling about reading the scene. So you you have to know what are the lights and you can also see the shadow uh, quality here. So how, how soft it is, what is the color and everything like this. Say for example, the lighting artist uh, gives you the render he has this one you can see here if you, if you for example if you put the robot here there are at least two lights in one right as so you can see the blue light and you can see the yellow light here in this chair so the lighting artist by mistake uh 100 sure they're gonna put both the lights but for sometimes it's uh maybe the concentration of this blue light is less uh than the yellow light in the render then now if we read the scene first we will get an idea of how much the blue contribution will be then we can go and push those passes uh, to achieve the desired results right so that's what i mean by reading the scene first we have to get a grip of like what what is the light in this shot it's very important i mean um, i don't know if you guys have photography background that helps a lot uh, of how the scene will look like, even small, small details, like what is the specular quality of this of this uh, scene, which will be very important here because we have speculars, right? We have to match to the actual shot. Okay, uh, now you have an understanding of the lighting involved in the shot. Um, so any questions or Venky, do you want me to wait till the end? No, you can go ahead, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, now, uh, the thing is like you have, okay, now you have an understanding of uh, what the light is here and the lighting conditions here. Right? Now you're bringing in your CG render. It depends on the studio and if you're doing freelance, uh, you get different passes. Make this bigger. Some things will be mandatory available. 
in and also depends on the render uh, renderer the names might be a little bit different but uh, concept remains the same um, here what do we have we can look at it right so this rgba the name is pretty much the beauty pass so this is what the lighting artist when he clicks it this is what he gets it's everything big then uh, and before that i would like to tell about why the passes uh why can't we just straight away comp with this uh why do we have to separate the passes that is because we had more control right like it has specular in it uh it has a reflection depends on the object you if you have a, a organic shape like a face uh, then you will have subsurface scattering in it so, so these are some of the passes so the main pass, I uh, so before that, I would like to tell something. So there are like three categories of passes, usually. Uh, so one is the color passes. Color passes means anything from diffuse, specular, uh, here reflection. Uh, these three are important. This is what I used to put this image, put together this image. And you will have shadow pass, which you may not need because it's it's baked in the diffuse lighting. Uh, so these are all color passes. Means you you need this uh, to achieve this beauty render. And this is the first uh, layer. And then there are tick passes. What are the tick passes? The main ones again. The tick passes differs depends on how complex the shot is and and what are the controls they're going to the the studio depends on the studio wherever you're working uh, but the main common one are the depth pass this is the depth pass for some reason it is rendered as other but this is depth um, so the depth pass what it has is the value that shows uh, how how deep is this object from the camera so you use this pass to defocus to get the proper focusing in your shot, right? Like focusing, you can see here, the FG is really defocused. And this is the mid ground where we are gonna put the robot. And you can see the shed, the tires, and that's the background. So uh, you can go here and yeah, so the depth values is usually baked in the red channel. Uh, I don't know if you can see this values here, you can see it's uh, so the chest area is 147.5 uh, and the hand you can see it's 150 so hand is obviously a little uh, closer to the camera than the chest so this will give uh, information about how far it is from the camera so so this is the depth pass useful in defocusing uh, which we will see a little later and some of the other passes here are normals this gives the orientation uh, this, uh, so I will show you what this is used later. So normal pass, you have this position pass. This this is very important. So you have world position and object position. So you will also might get camera position, meaning how so this object relative to the camera where it is in 3D space. And the world position is relative to the scene itself. Uh, for example, what, what do I mean by scene itself? This the whole thing is a scene. And and in in Maya wherever they are uh, setting it up in layout, so the position of the robot in the position pass is relative to the world rather than the distance from the camera. You can see the values, red, green, blue. That is X Y Z. So in 3D space, it's in minus 88, minus 149. That's where the in the 3D space the object is. So this is one of the pass. And uh, uh, we don't have a lot here. We might get a lot more, uh, but this is enough for now. These are the basic. And so these are all the tech passes, right? Hey, hey, and, uh, uh, hey Bala, yeah. so uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I have a question from the chat. Um, uh, it's from Sai. What is the portion pass used for in comp usually? What's the main purpose of it? I, I will show you a little later. First, I will okay. explain so, so that it's in it's one by one, right? So yeah, sorry, then yeah. it'll be a little confusing. Okay. Um, so, uh, so Bala, sorry about Bala. that. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, so Bala, I have a question. So um, uh, you're showing us uh, all these passes uh, rendered from lighting. So, yeah. and also you talked about the uh, pipeline. 
So what are the major uh, pauses? Uh, actually, we need to do uh, to just to start the uh, CG compositing. To yeah, that, that's again coming in. I just want to explain the three categories of pauses. Okay. Then I will show go about explaining. I have it here. Uh, I will show you what are the three I'm using to rebuild the color, and which pass I'm using to defocus, and which pass I'm using for what. Um, is that okay? Uh, uh, that's fine. Uh, so my question is, uh, all these pauses will get uh, will, will get the different pauses from the lighting to comp. Is that also will uh, different like in in a different companies uh, they use a different kind of a pipeline. Mm -hmm. So all these uh, so most of the pauses uh, will be the same, and some pauses you will get extra. Yeah. And in this comp like in this CGs or oh, fine, you got like uh, these many pauses, and also you can talk about a little more uh, like extra pauses that we can get that would can help for the uh, comp also. Yeah, sure. Uh, I will talk about the extra. Yes. Pauses yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, first, I will finish what we have here. Uh, so, okay, you, you want to talk about the extra passes? We can go one by one. Uh, so, in the color passes, you have uh, diffuse. Uh, diffuse is pretty much the color information, um, and also the shadow is baked in this, so it's diffuse lighting. Uh, just the color, there is no specular, there is no... So if you see the characteristics, this is a metal surface, right? So w what do you usually have in a metal surface? You have you will have reflection in it. You will have specular, like shininess in it. Right? These, are, these are some of the characteristics. So if you think about that, okay, what are the things they gave us here will match it. So they gave us color information, sure. And then they gave us specular, this will give the shininess uh, to the object and they gave us the specular and also, also they gave us uh, reflections. Uh, so the one thing, uh, so Venki, you were asking, right? Like what is the extra you might get? Oh, so sick. the extra you might, uh, yeah. yeah so the extra, I can go ahead, right? So the extra is, so you are, here you have diffuse lighting, just one plane diffuse, right? You might have two diffuses. What, what does it mean? One is direct lighting, direct diffuse, and one is indirect diffuse. So there are uh, two lightings, uh, two uh, quality of lighting, I can say. I cannot say the uh, usual word, but the direct lighting is simply, okay, when, when uh, I'll explain the shot. So you, here you have a light, right? So this light, uh, if you can see my cursor, it, it is directly hitting here. So this area is direct lighting. It is directly affected by this. What happens, it's usually the rays will get bounced in CG, in CG and in non, that is what CG uh, softwares are mimicking. In real life, when the light ray hits here, it will bounce. When it is bouncing, it will take the lighting information of this area and it will take it to this area, wherever it is bouncing, right? So, where, so for example, this blue light, when it when the blue light hits here, this is the direct light. So what it will do, once the ray reaches here, it will take the lighting information from here and it will bounce to the other areas. So this constant infinite bounce will happen. Uh, so the, the first ray that hits, that is the direct lighting, that contributes to the direct lighting. The things that hits uh, and moves around the scene, those are all indirect lighting. That is what will give you, uh, so details like this, right? We can, you can see under the table, you have some information here. These are all like indirect lighting because the rays have bounced and coming here. So uh, also you can see on the latest gaming consoles and stuff, they are talking about, um, Hmm, what is the term? Um, ray tracing, that is what it is. Uh, that So the ray tracing is not exactly this, but uh, global illumination they are using, starting to use in a lot of games that, so what, instead of baking the light in the scenes, they will just let the rays hit and the rays will automatically do the work. You don't have to bake it in the texture because that is how the real life, uh, real in the real world, that's how the light works. It hits, it bounces, moves around. Uh, so you get all this extra details and fill, that is the fill lighting you're getting. Otherwise, all these places will be dark. There won't be any light here, right? Because there is no direct light on top of this chair. Uh, if the chair is under, you're, you, what you're seeing is an indirect light.
So in the diffuse layer, you will get that. So, um, so you will get direct light and indirect light. What that indirect the light is used for? Um, sometimes the scene is very contrasty, and the supervisor is asking you, uh, you know what? I don't need that. I just want the want it to be really contrasty, and I don't want all the extra uh, diffuse lighting here. So you take it up. So that it is useful in there. But here we have just the one, so we will go with that. Th that's what I meant by you will get extra passes. So you will get. Again, you will get for diffuse, you will get indirect specular, you will get indirect reflection, and in uh, in uh, organic surfaces, uh, skin types, you will get subsurface scattering. Mm, also, that is uh, that is a property uh, for skin to give the translucent look. Um, you can read also read detail about that. So those are some of the extra passes you will get. You if you have um, caustics, you might get that. And if you have um, uh, mirrors and there's so many reflection, they might give it a separate. So they might give a lot more than these three uh, so that you have a wider control on how you're adjusting. Cool. So uh, so the, those are some of the color extra passes in color wise. In the tech pass wise, uh, the normal things you're going to use is depth, which is pretty common and you want that. Uh, you will get position pass. I will explain this position pass in detail. I have a setup I can explain there. Position pass in one line is just gives you the position of the object in the 3D space. You, because you don't know, right, like uh, where the object is placed. You are just looking at a 2D image. You don't know the 3, 3D location of this. So this position pass will give you where the 3D location of the object. You can see here in the world position, you can see this is X, Y, Z. This is where in the 3D scene uh, the robot is placed. So th that is the use usefulness of position pass. The normal pass you can use the orientation of the surface, surface orientation. Um, so that you can use for relighting and also for some other stuff and for uh, for giving getting bump and stuff like that. I can show you one use of that a little later. Uh, relighting. If you get a good render, you're not mostly going to do relighting of your scene. That is very rare. If your render is not good, then yeah, you might go and do relighting. Or in extreme cases, if you're adding some extra lights and stuff like that, you won't relight. But most of the time, not. Uh, so those are some of the tech passes, important tech passes. I mean, like you can get a motion vector pass uh, because sometimes, for some reason, because most of the time they will break the motion blur. If the if the robot is running around and it has motion blur in it, they're gonna bake it in this diffuse in the specular everything in the color layers. They're gonna bake the motion blur. If for some reason they're not baking it, they will give you a motion vector pass, which you can use it uh, use the motion vector in nodes like vector blur. In nodes like this, um, you can use it to create the blur, but that's gonna be a heavy. Uh, thing for comp to do. So in my experience, most of the times they just make and the blur in it, and it's also pretty accurate coming from a 3D render. Um, so those are some extra uh, tech passes, and then we will move to ID passes. So three categories: one is color, the next one is uh, tech, and the third one is ID. ID is also very very important. Um, so what is ID pass? Is basically so the CG artist will go and assign uh, so separate layer, separate colors for different parts. For example, if we want to color correct just the chest area or just this hand, this one hand, then we need control, right? The, we don't want to do roto. That's like the worst thing you can do doing roto in your CG render. You don't want that. So they will give you uh, IDs assigned. So for example, you see here they assigned a green color. Blue color and red. I can show you here. What I did is like, okay, I went to the render. I shuffled in. Um, uh, so this shuffle is weird. It's new to all. So um, So 
so here i have i took the id i believe id2 and then uh, in your old uh, new i think you can just press uh, you can just bring all the channels to green and it will give you the green color right and you can see in the alpha now you have a alpha of just a hand now you can go now you can use this as a mask and put it in your color correct node or grade node and do adjustments right so so id is basically used for you to give more control in color correction wise so this is the basic id passes uh, which we are using this is the old school technique now they are also using thing called cryptomat uh, you can google and read cryptomat is basically a advanced thing which we i am using pretty much in every shot which is uh basically see the drawback of this is like you have ids only for few, the, for the whole body they assigned one id layer right but that might not cut the case you might need to adjust the color in this bolt uh so you want more control so they will assign crypto mat can be assigned uh per object wise per material wise object wise means this bolt bolt might be a separate object in the 3d so they will uh, so they will assign one id like you know how they assign green so they might assign one color uh, it's, it's so it's limitless it's not just rgb they just go about uh, so infinite possibilities so they can assign one color for this so one color for this plate one color for just this layer right screen right uh, chest plate on and on so you have like so many like hundreds of uh uh colors there so then they you will bring a node called cryptomat i don't have it here i think you can go download in wikipedia uh you just pick like a picker like you can like this in the grade node you can just go pick the color and it will just give you a you know how it gave you an alpha like here like that it will give you a mat uh for that specific area for example you are to selecting this bolt you will get a mat for that now you can go on just uh just that area so crypto mat we, we don't have here but uh, you will get it in the production scene so that is very useful that is one of the id passes so these are the three uh, varieties of passes we will usually get uh, from lighting department so uh, so now now i will move on about how we are going to use to achieve the result right So I'm just showing you an example is not going to be production ready or anything just uh, to understand the concept. So in this uh this was achieved easy. I just put together you can see diffuse and reflection. I just plussed it. Usually it should work if 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 uh, the render is proper. Uh you might it, this is all it takes to rebuild. Uh you you put the two three passes together. you can see i will ab it that's it a this is the beauty render and this is the one the three passes i put together so you are using right. a shuffle node to extract the passes yes. from so, so shuffle node. node yeah i just put a shuffle node and yeah you can nuke to all it is like this just go and select your diffuse lighting now you get a diffuse layer so this is the diffuse layer the specular reflection then i am just doing a plus and then plus so this will give me so when you are abing it you should get the exact result if something is missing it looks different then then you might need extra passes or some passes is not working you should ultimately check it with your uh, beauty render it should exactly match that's when we know it's been rebuilt properly Cool. and the one thing i want to mention is like this process of rebuilding if you if you're a freelancer if you're doing your own cg uh then you might just render a multi this is called a multi channel exr this pretty this exr image has so many layers baked in right that's multi channel exr so you will probably use this and you will be rebuilding in in production studio wise this is all done for you you just click a button you're importing and all these layers are already built for you you're not doing it but this is a good knowledge to have um, so that will come from uh, lighting that lighting slab comp so that yeah the slab they will do a slab comp and uh, 
they will hand that's how the pipeline works the the lighting department what they will do is like okay so they have to present to their own supervisor right so they will bring in the render of what they did they have to check if something is broken it's on them they cannot just give it to us so they will check their layers they will uh, bring a new in, in they will import in the new they will check if everything is working and they will pass on the nukes into us and you're just opening the slab comp and going from there uh, you're not even sometimes uh, rebuilding it from the scratch you're just opening the nukes uh, ultimately so um cool. thank you Paul. yeah uh so here to achieve this color image i just put together these three uh, passes Bala, yeah. Uh... yeah. There's a question from uh, Jude Gayan. Uh, sorry, I want to tell him about him. Like, I want to give a shout out to him. Uh, Jude Gayan is a uh, is a lighter. Uh, he helps uh, to lighting for this shot. Okay. So he has a question. Uh, thanks, Jude, uh, for the lighting. And uh, he has a question: Can all uh, color passes be pushed in, uh, or there are any other color passes that need to that need a multi or anything else? Um, what do you mean by like? Uh, like, asking, uh, like uh, oh, yeah. Do you need any other passes to be plugged in here? No, yeah. what I'm saying, uh, any other blending method that you can use it? Oh, no, no. Usually this plus will work if, if uh, in my, I mean, like uh, if you're using shadow or anything, you, you can do a different merge, multiply, I mean, multiply and stuff like that. But like the shadow is baked in this diffuse lighting. So Whereas you're you not... Get you yeah, get the you, occlusion you, passes yeah you yeah you get the occlusion pass then you do so for example you are let's say um you are getting just imagine this right like the robot is standing near this wall and the and the and the shadow of the robot is falling in this wall now you will get a shadow pass for the wall because you your shadow pass for the robot won't be enough right because it's casting in this wall so you will get a shadow pass of the wall. So first you have to put the shadow pass here. If you can see, you will plug it here. In that case, you can either do like a grade and you can bring in the shadow pass like here. You can bring in not the shadow pass, the one that you get for the wall. Uh, so you will get a, you can shuffle in just the alpha and you can plug it in the mask and just bring down the gain. So you will get the shadow there. That is one method. Or hey, if they Mama. give an occlusion, yeah. Hey, I have a question for you. Uh, Jude asked this yeah. question. Uh, can all color passes be plus in? Are there any color passes that need to be multiplied or anything else? No, no, it, it all can be plus in. Uh, there's no need for any other. If That's what I was saying. Like if, if it is all working properly, all it takes is plus. You plus, plus, plus any color information you need and you're going to achieve this beauty render. Uh, nothing. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so once you get this color, uh, so now you, what I will do is now you got the color information all brought in. Okay. Now you dropped it into the scene, right? I dropped it into the scene. I, I turned off all this grading notes. That's fine. Um, so first thing is that's, that's when, you know, that's what comes into, uh, use now the reading of the scene, uh, the lighting properties. So it will give you how intense the specular should be, uh, how the black level should be like. So, and one thing I want to show before moving on to integrating this is a HDR image. I'm I'm sure you guys all know what a HDR image is. It's it's an image that holds value above one, so you get all the good highlight like brightness details. Uh, so the CG render. It's a HDR image, right? You can see the value, it's going above one. It's rendered in HDR, you have it. But the plate we are using is not, which won't be the case in production, you're gonna get a HDR plate. So you don't have to worry if you can see, it's clamping anything above one into one. You can see one, one, one. So that's why all this is washed up uh this is this won't be the case if you take a camera take a shoot and if you gain this down you have you're gonna see all the details here it might be the place here might be really bright this you might see all the red color here so what it what this one is doing is anything that crosses above one it is clamping to one 
So it gives a washed outlook. Uh, it won't give the pop uh, as the uh, image is supposed to be. So the, I just want to mention that I have an image here to explain. So this is a HDR image. Mm, can see uh, it looks really washed out here, right? Like this looks like there's no detail. But if you can go, there's so much detail here, right? And also you can see it looks like it's washed out, but no, it has so much details built in. In a normal non-HDR image, this will all look just like this because it's clamping it to one. Uh, why this is useful? Uh, so, so this is HDR, and then we'll move to black point and I'll show the HDR usefulness, and then we go to specular details. So first thing is uh, now you have the scene, you dropped in your render. First thing I will do is, OK, what the black levels of this uh, robot should be. That will be the first thing I will go. Before adjusting any color saturation, uh, this should be bright, dark. Before anything, you want to go and set your black levels. So what is black levels is, so this scene uh, has its own black level and white level. Black level is the blackest point of this shot. Uh, and a uh, white point is the not, it, it says whitest point, but you might get, uh, yeah, it is the whitest point, but um, I will show you a little later. So this is the black, uh, so for, to check the black point, you can like really gain it up and see it. So these areas are like really dark, right? So these are all the black points in this shot. So your CG renders black, point, black level should match the scenes because ultimately that's what you're doing. So you, you, you take a grade note, and uh, you, you guys can see here you have black point, white point, lift, gain. These four will be used to achieve, uh, to set the black point of, and white point of a CG render. So we'll go with the black point first. So basically you're selecting the blackest point, uh, the value in the um, CG render. You can see, you can maybe select here, or maybe select this, we go select this. I will usually turn this off uh, when I'm picking it so that it's not changing in front of your face. Uh, so now you said what it does is, now you selected the black one. What it does is like, let's see. So this value you can see, right, 0 0.0025, it has some value. It is not zero. It's not ultimate black. So now once you select the black point here, you can now go and pick it. You can see it's turned into zero. What you're telling you to do is take this value of 0 0.0025 in red and green and blue and change it into pixel perfect black to zero. Now you have set the black point. Now you have a black point in your CG render. But this is not the black point of the scene. So you told Nuke to make it zero. Now you ha you have to lift it. It uh, says the word here. It's, so you have to lift the black, the zero value, to the blackest point here. The, all the black ones will have some value. So you pick this lift. You choose the picker. For example, you can also see this black point has some kind of blue tint. So you can select this now. You go here. with and without. So it changed the black point. You can, if you guys can see, it's changing uh, the black levels. Uh, this is not drastic in the shot because it's pretty contrasty. But in shots like this, this is an atmospheric perspective. Uh, this is what's called an atmospheric perspective. You can see how farther it goes. It has fog and atmosphere. So your black point changes, right? Um, so you can see here your black point is really crushed. And while here, uh, it's very lifted. The black is actually blue here. Um, so yeah, so if you're placing the robot here, your black point will be different. Placing the robot here, your black point will be different. So you, you need to set that first. Uh, so you now you, have, you set your black point. And then you can move to white point. Um, so in this case, in this particular shot, I won't. Uh, go and set the white point because the whitest point in this is the specular detail. What will happen is 
uh, if you select the white point, see, select this, it will, it will, it will clip it into one. You don't want that to happen uh, because you want to preserve all those HDR details, right? So I uh, here I won't do white point where the white point might be useful is for example you're replacing this wall they are giving you a cg wall right in that case this value is not above one so you can select your black point as the blackest value and the white point is this and you will you will automatically get a really good result so okay now we set the change this into one so now we set the black point here uh, now we will uh, move on here. We're not going to set the white point, so we will move on to the specular details. So here you have an idea of how uh, the specular, how bright the specular will be. And these are all metal surfaces, so you can get a reference of, this is also metal, so you can get a reference of how specular this robot should be based on, uh, based on this um, metal surfaces, right? Uh, in reality, in this shot, you just have to clamp it because you just have to clamp now. Hey, you matched your specular because because you are just matching it to a non-HDR image. So, but like in usually, uh, this is your specular highlight. So you will go read what uh, color you have and the shot you can see. Uh, so, so this is, and in plain sight, it will look white, but it will, uh, it will have some, you can see it has some blue in it. So you have 2.6, 2.6, 2.8, just a little bit of more blue. So then you have to come and match the same exact value. Uh, you can set it either in your white point, or you can just go here. That's when the layers come into effect. Uh, so you can go to your specular layer, right? This is you can see the specular is not in any other layers. The high bright points are all in one layer. So you can go here. You can put a color correct node. You can you have a highlight uh, thing here, so you can go and adjust your blue if you want to increase blue, decrease. So you can do all your color correct. Layer. So this will set the highlight colors. Um, so that's when the layers come in handy. So you do this, you now you set your black point and also your white point, the brightest uh, place, right? Now, and after that, what do you do? So why I'm saying these are all some of the basic things uh, the supervisors might look, but because when you look at like this, it might all look okay, but then when you gain down, it should all flow properly. Uh, if this color is not matching to this color, then it's wrong. So these things will slowly push the shot towards realistic as possible. Um, then you can go and adjust uh, anything else you want. If you if it feels it is a little bit saturated, uh, then you can reduce the saturation. Uh, then usually what I will do is like I will check into how bright this object should be in this scene, right? Like what is the luminance? It is it is standing here near this pillar, so this pillar has this much light, so it will also have a little bit more, it will also be a little bit more bright. That's why I, I did some, I did push the brightness a little bit. Uh, see, I'm doing it in the diffuse layer rather than, because I don't want to push the specular. I think the shininess is already too much. So I'm just uh, increasing the brightness in the diffuse, uh, just leaving the specular and reflection alone. Right, so, uh, so, this this you will go on and on about doing color adjustments then you might think okay this leg should be a little darker then you can bring in your ids like this you can bring in the id and you can go in there as a overall or you can in the diffuse layer whatever you want to do whatever it is needed to achieve uh close as possible and once you are done with the color informations, I mean, match the lighting close as possible, then you move on uh, to focusing. Uh, focus of uh, object is very important because it will look really odd if you look like this. Um, have, then you have to go, once you set your color, then you're going to focus. 
that's when the depth uh, pass comes into effect um so what i'm doing is i'm just going shuffling uh my depth uh, depth into this main channel i mean this main pipe so now if i go and check i have the depth here right so in this shot it is very simple um, because he is just standing there he is in the depth level of this pillar right you can see there is a little bit defocus here so in this you might just get away with just doing some you, you can just drop in a defocus now put in a defocus it might work but where the depth will actually be useful is for example he is reaching his hand to him and his body is in this plane and his hand is towards the character right so you have you're dealing with two different focus now this fg is really defocus than the middle ground so in that case what you will have is in the depth your hand here it has 150 value it will have even the closer it comes the more the value so you will have a different value uh, so you can which in the you can open a defocus node and in the defocus for the math i usually go with depth there are different maths here but the depth is the one that relates uh, it's it's pretty straightforward how far the object is from the camera that is the depth map then in the focus plane you can put in the value if you see if you want this area to be focused focus means there is no defocus there this is the focused area then you can put 147 then that area will be focused all the remaining areas will be defocused um and in the size you can push the values of how much the defocus you you want to push it for example so this area will be in focus right so if his hand is reaching towards uh, him if you push the size value uh, relatively the maximum should be more than the size because when you're clipping it this is the maximum value it can go so the size uh, if you go if you put 20 or 5 or whatever it's needed to achieve this focus so this hand will have more defocus here, but the body will have uh, less defocus. So it, it suits, the, it matches the scene better. Uh, I cannot actually show you that real example here because um, it's all in the same plane, but uh, I understand you get the idea. Uh, so now you finish the focus. Now it is sitting well in your shot. The next thing you will go and do is uh, adding irregularities, imperfections, you can call, to the CG render. So any render from the lighting department or uh, the Maya camera, the 3D department cameras, are perfect cameras. It doesn't represent the real-world cameras. All the real-world camera lens has imperfections. It's not perfect. Imper imperfections means uh, you will have distortion depends on the focal length of your lens you might all know uh, it might so distortion means like you can see this pipe should be in straight line but it is not it is little curved um, this pipe should, is little curved compared it should be straight why this is happening because when the light is all pushed uh, in that same focus plane it is it is pushing so much information it is bending it's not going into the perfect uh, uh, into the into the focus plane perfectly, right? That happens in all the real world cameras. So there are so many inf imperfections. I will show you about three, uh, which is majorly used. One is distortion. All cameras, most cameras have distortion in it. The less the focal length, the more the distortion is going to be. You can see a wide angle lens. So one is so once you do your defocusing. Now, so this distortion node usually comes from the layout tracking department. So what they do is they take the uh, hey, Bala, scene. Uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Uh, I have a question from Craig. Uh, yeah. Will using a Chrome ball and set uh, help better refine CG lighting layer? Chrome ball is what they're going to use in the lighting department to recreate uh, the lighting properties of the actual scene. That's why you're going to get closer to, that's why I was saying 80% or 90% to the scene because they're 
every production studio they are using the chrome ball that is what hdr i mean so they are, they are going to use the map uh, the spherical map to achieve uh, the lighting then they will also put uh, physical lights in the maya or 3d programs in to get even closer look but yeah they 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 will be using the chrome ball yes but we are not going to use the in the lighting department they will use that's how this is created so does it answer yes yeah, i think it does. yeah yeah all right uh so so usually when the scene comes into the tracking department right they they will undistort the image they will remove all these distortions out because the tracking software cannot provide a proper solve uh when all this uh curve and distortion happening in the edges the edges will all slip and it won't work so they will understand the image send it to the tracking department then they track it then they give that perfect camera now it is a perfect camera right because it doesn't have any distortion then they pass it on to the cg departments they use that camera to render this uh uh this geo or robot and then they give it to you now as a compositor you have to reintroduce all the distortions otherwise it will look perfect and won't match the actual lens of what is used in the what is used for the shooting of this shot right so i'm introducing so this distortion node you don't have to worry about this this will come from the layout department you're just going to plug it so this it's a redistort right like depends on the studio they have uh, custom tools for this and stuff so they will you just plug it in that's it and it will give you some distortion like this uh, so this is again one step closer uh, to achieving as uh, realistic as possible then one of the imperfection the shots is chromatic aberration it's also called fringing color fringing uh, if you look in uh, any photos it might be very less to really complex like this this has so much aberrations right you can see the color bleeding happening is purple fringing it's also called purple fringing you can see all this uh colors that is on the outside outer layer this is just caused by uh, every light is in different wavelength it all has to <laughs> enter the focus plane in the lens all at the same exact spot but doesn't happen uh, it bends and curves and uh, doesn't to that that is the imperfection right so so some will slip this color bleeding will happen so you, you have to introduce this into your shot so you have to go to your scene and check how the color bleeding is because look at this this has so much bleeding here our shot no, does not have that much it has some you can see some red spilling happening here it's very minute in the shot but mm, yeah i can see a little bit here a little bit here you can see some green uh, fringing happening so you're going to reintroduce that it's called chromatic aberration now this tool i just put together to show here but like uh, you can go on newkipedia you have so many chromatic aberration tools so so i look at this i'm turning it off it doesn't have any fringe it's perfect right they just now i have it on it has some red fringing here so this is one thing uh, introducing chromatic this is one of the imperfections and then uh one of the most important thing is matching the grain uh this is uh, again all the shots have grain in baked in as you all know you can go press the r letter you can see in the red channel i usually go like this r green blue uh the grain is mostly prevalent in the blue channel than any other channel it's, it's nasty in some shots in blue channel um than any other channel so you can go check out how the grain is looking and then you have to you have to put the grain in your cg render right so again this is nukes uh, grain tool a kodak no um but the i'm just using it for here but you you might get really advanced this won't cut it like you will get really advanced uh grain so what i usually do is how to match the grain so once you get the shot you will denoise the plate uh, so this is nukes own denoise tool you are denoising the plate you are just 
So you just put in the denoise node and you select the source wherever you want. Usually you select the source in the plain color. You don't want to select it in where the, there's so much texture like this area. You want to select it in, uh, in a plain color like this while this has less texture. So, so you can see it's very minute here. So I may not see a lot. I'll zoom in. You can see it is denoising. Now you have a denoised image, right? Uh, so then you bring in your grain tool here, plug it. So then you go select white. In, in one part, you're selecting your footage. In the other area, you're selecting your grain. So you can see the wiper. Mm. So this is the red channel, right? OK. Uh, actually, we are introducing so much plane. Now we have to go. So you have to go channel by channel. It won't work in RGB. You have to go one by one to get accurate as possible. So this is the red channel. You can see in one area it is really too strong. And here in the plate, it is very less. So intensity controls, as the name says, intensity. See, it is reducing. Size, as it, is, it reduces the size of the noise. Um, irregularity don't use a lot and reduce the size. So now you're matching, then you go to the blue channel, green channel. And you reduce it and reduce the size. Go to the blue, um, reduce the size, reduce the intensity. Now you can play the shot to check if your green uh, is properly playing, it should it should match in all the three channels. Uh, why we are matching it in the plate and not in the CG render? Because we are matching it here so that now what we have is a grain of the plate baked into this grain node, right? Now you can take this grain node and just plug it here. Some expression. So you plug it here. Now your image will also have grain of the plate in it. Uh, so introduce the grain. So this is the third one. This is very important. Um, also, some studios nowadays they are using scans, which is pretty advanced. Rather than the tools, it's just an image. They are going to plus it. Uh, it's pretty advanced. We will leave it for now. But usually, you will be uh, using a, a grain node to match your plate grain to your CG render grain. Uh, so, you, so these are the three irregularities I will usually add in my shot. And then you can go add on about vignetting. Vignetting is also irregularity. If you can see uh, in the corners, there will be a little darker than the center parts. That's also one of the uh, lens effect. So you can also do that. I will, you can just put, I'll just drop like this. Since our render is in the center, it won't be affecting. But for example, you have something here, then you can just do this inverted. What it will give you, it will give you the edges, right? Um, and you can put a grain node, use this as a mask and reduce it on the sign. You won't see it here because, again, like CG is in the center. This is one of the irregularities it's called vignetting. Um, so that is also useful. So these are the four major things I will add. Um, and so, then, uh, yeah. Uh, Bala, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. so you're adding grind uh, from the uh, new uh, default tool uh, through grind node. But yeah. uh, actually, uh, in, in the short, uh, the grind will affect uh, differently, whereas in uh, dark or bright areas. So how we can uh, control that? Uh, in very, very good, very good uh, question. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I forgot to tell that. Yes, it will change. Uh, so you can see, it, it, so this is the shot is not a really a heavy grain shot. So, um, so I like, that's what I was saying. Hey, this grain tool won't cut it. Like this is not good enough. You have this black and minimum maximum here, but usually, like you can go on Wikipedia, you can you will have controls that says blacks and whites are are um, in like it, it, so you have two different. Uh, uh, controls to adjust the grain in the blacks 
and you will have a control to adjust in the white areas and the bright areas so you mean you, you the have luminance the, value yes so like the, you know how we have one intensity here you yeah. will have two intensities one for the dark and one for the bright areas so you will go to this so you know how we were doing this white mm. this white so you will go to this black area you look this here it looks a lot yeah. when you come to the dark you sure it, it might look correct right so one doing one grain for the whole plane might not work as uh, it like i'll say 50% 50% 50, 50 like 40 to 50% it works one one grain but in most cases you might go and adjust for the dark area separate and white area separate that's, that's yeah uh, you you will have control. I, I can assure you. you can go search in Newpedia. You will have so many grain notes that has far more advanced. And some grain notes nowadays are available. You just plug and play. Um, so yeah. Cool. Hey, Thank Baba. you. So there's a question in the chat. It's from Ch Sai. Uh, do we have to denoise CG or does it come with denoised? No, no, no. You so the renders will come denoised, right? Because uh, like I said, that's the like the 3D software cameras are perfect cameras. It doesn't so the grain and the chromatic aberration, distortion. These are all imperfections in the real world camera lens. These won't be in the CG uh, camera. So anything that comes from the CD CG program won't have any of this. Nothing. It won't have any grain. It, uh, so we, we, sometimes you have noise. Some people will confuse it as a grain. That is actually a noise. Like I think you have <clears throat> in the lighting when they have use lower samples, it will have noise. Uh, but that won't be the case in production. You will get pretty clean image. So you won't have any grain to answer that question. Cool. Hey, thanks, Bala. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so then once we match the irregularities, then this is like the final step. One of the other steps. I will do is like this is called light wrap. Um, so what light wrap does is like so you know you see how the edges. Edges are not like when you zoom in like this, it's it it might not sit better in the corner in the in the edges of the CG. It's like too dark and here it's white. It's not sitting better. So what light wrap does is like it just brings the luminance values um from the plate uh, so you connect uh, the bg it's b is called bg so bg is your uh, plate and foreground is your render when you connect that into this it gives you this light information in the car in the edges uh usually it won't be like this i just click the generate wrap only otherwise it will look like this you don't want this i this is my method i usually get only the lighting uh, from this i will switch off the color so if you click generate wrap only, it will give you just the the edgy lighting. So so where it if you can see here it is complete black, right? Here it is bright. How? Uh, because in your background plate, this area is really bright and this area is dark. So wherever the bright spot is, you're gonna get the lighting information because ultimately what we are doing is we are introducing some of those lights bleeding into these dark edges. Here it is already dark, so you don't have to do anything. So you get this, then I will shuffle out the alpha. So there's no alpha in this. Then this is this is your comp image, right? Where you did color correction and everything. Then I will just, just go and do a plus. See, I'm just adding just slightly. It won't affect any of your inner uh, areas, just the edges. You can see, Turn, turned off. Down. just a little bit so it just a little bit flows better you can obviously do a lot more uh to blaze so th these are all again one of those things make it close as possible so this is light we call light bleeding that's what you're doing you're bringing in the light from scene to your cg render so this is one of the useful things again the bg is your plate and the foreground is your cg render you plug that in shuffle out the alpha you have just the lighting information you can just plus it um yeah so 
you do this, then any roto you have, just put it on top. Yeah, that's. So these are the common things I will look for in a CG render. Um, so uh, one thing I will, before wrap up, I will show you one thing. So you're asking for the position normal passes, right? Yeah. One of the important uh, uses I do is, so this is a 2D image, but say, for example, you want to visualize in 3D, right? So to get a better idea of what is happening. Uh, this is just one object, so it might be easy. So for example, you have this whole set you're replacing in CG, right? So you want to understand what is happening instead of you're just dealing with a 2D image. So there is a tool called Position to Points. Uh, what it does is like it uses the position data uh, that is provided from the render uh, to to show us where the uh, CG object is actually in the 3D space. So this this point is happening because some render anomalies are happening. It it won't happen. Render. So this is yeah. Uh, don't worry about this. So you can see here, right? This is your camera angle. Now you have it in your 3D space. If you have your camera here, your camera will probably come here. It will probably come here. Now you can visualize. For example, check like that. Like you have the whole set here, um, like this. Right? Like you have this FG object, this middle ground. You don't know uh, where is where. So just to visualize, uh, not just to visualize. So you also, first I will tell you how to achieve this. So in the position position to points. So the first pipe is your RGB. You just connected, I will just connect it to the image. And the next pipe says position. Here you look, I'm bringing in the world position. Right, this is the world position uh, from here. So here is the world position. World position means it's relative to the world space, not to the camera. So this is actually this is where it is. This is where the robot is placed in the actual 3D Maya. So, so that goes to position normal. You don't usually actually need it, but anyways, it has the option. So I'm plugging it to the normal pass. This is your normal pass. So once you do that, you will get this, and then you can go to your 3D viewer and you can see. Uh, now you have your 3D representation of the uh, thing. So uh, one thing is like one is for visualization. Another, so if, say for example, uh, you're adding some smoke near his hand, then you can put a card uh, near his hand. Uh, instead of doing it in 2D, you can just put a card here and put some smoke, project some smoke on the card. It's, it's a little advanced, but I'm saying like these are some of the extra useful of the position to points. Main thing is you can visualize your 3D scene. So so my battery is, uh, phone battery charge is running out. I'll just plug it in my power. Give me yeah. one second. Uh, yeah, but I have another question. So when you showed that uh, uh, the position pass, so you put a card like uh, in the CG, right? So how do you visualize yeah. that card in, uh, uh, compared to a plate, like for example, like you put a card there, right? uh, like near us, and yeah. Yes. So here I'm putting the card um, uh, near. See, wait. Let's hope, let's drop in a card. Uh, so. Okay, we have a card here, right? It automatically goes to the center. This is the world center of new, right? Zero zero zero. Yeah. So it goes. It that's where the card is created. Let's increase the size. Let's see more. So. Here it is really useful, easy because you're just moving the card to this space. Uh, now you're putting the. It's easy when you put a card next to the um, uh, the robot because you know the position of the robot now, mm. so you can drop the card here. But what if you want to drop the card? in the background wall, right? Mm. Uh, in that case, it won't work because you don't know where the background wall is here. Right? Uh, yeah, but I so, think uh, my question is, I understood the concept of it. My question is like, you put the card near the uh, the mech, right? But how do you visualize yeah. that card in the plate? Oh, uh, the 2D plate. Yeah, yeah the 2D plate. Yeah, the, then uh, I need a camera for that. 
um oh you need a camera not okay okay makes sense yeah so i will show you here just like put a regular setup here like scan line render um so the scan line render is converting a 3d image into 2d image so you mm-hmm. connect your camera so the camera you get from the tra- tracking department yeah. you put the scene here and the bg uh, you have to connect here then you this is a 2d image mm-hmm. um here you want uh, yeah you see you get a constant a constant here You see this? Yeah. Uh, the okay. card is obviously now oh, sitting there. Oh, okay, makes sense. Okay. Yeah, right. Now, if you're merging it, now you have the card. So instead of the constant, if you have a smoke, then the smoke will show up here. So yeah. Oh, okay. That is so, the 3D space. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So the scan line under yeah converts a 3D data into 2D. Thanks, Bala. Thanks for your time, and uh, we look forward to do more uh, sessions with you in future. Great. Thank you, guys. And have a good have luck a for your career. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.